wafting up from the ground below. It was Blondel, the minstrel. A beautiful story. And like most tales, completely false. <laughs> However, I measure the truth of a tale, not by its literal accuracy, but by the feelings it inspires in our hearts, for there is more truth sometimes in belief than in that which is etched in stone and granite. And I believe that there is no sorcery greater than that which, with a keen mind and a lively imagination, can be wrought upon a printed page. And with that being said, it gives me... Is this an introductory speech? Sure, why not? Is he here? With that being said, with that being said, it gives me great pleasure and even greater honor from Camelot to modern day Tempe, Arizona, I give you Master Virgil Grenzuli. Because I don't dance or sing. No. All the best. Yes. But uh, thank you all for coming, and it's just great to see some um, familiar faces here, some old friends, and some very new friends. And what I thought I would do tonight is tell you what led to this book read you a couple of short sections from it, if I can see it on the small screen, um, give you my idea of why the Arthur stories have been so popular for so long, and I am a writer, I'm not an academic, so this is all coming out of my head. And then uh, finally, uh, talk a little bit about if there really was an Arthur, who was it? Okay, so the, uh, all right, the story starts, believe it or not, in 1967 with a Ouija board. Now, if you don't know what a Ouija board is, it's supposed to be a way that you can get questions answered about your future through some otherworldly spirit or force. The way it works is you see it has letters, it has numbers, it has yes and no. This is the, this is the pointer. So two people sit down, they, put, they each put their fingers on it from the opposite side. The idea being that, that one person cannot consciously or subconsciously move this thing. So here I am, 1967, a graduate student in business school, hating every minute of it, and uh, finding a release, writing short stories at night, and thinking I and actually trying to write a novel. And uh, I came from a working class family, so um, I commuted. And I came home from graduate school one day, and there's my sister Carol, who's a junior in college with her friend Martha, and I'm playing with a Ouija board. So of course I'm the older guy. I said, what, what nonsense is this? How could you get involved with anything as stupid and silly as a Ouija board. You're asking questions like, when will I get married? How many children will I have? So they said, we're having fun. Go away. He was no. You know, this was a gold mine of potential humor and humiliation. So I went into the house. I went out the back door. I snuck around. And I hid behind a big arrow. And at the right moment, I was going to jump out. And I was going to make fun of them again. Only now they were talking about me. <laughs> okay, so I stayed hidden, and they said, uh, and what will Virgil do? And it spelled out, Virgil will be a writer, and he will make a million dollars out of it. Now, 1967, that's a lot. It turned out to be true, the Ouija board just didn't say it would take me 40 years and a lot of inflation. That part was true. The next thing they asked was, what will be the name of his first book? And it spelled out, Night, K-N-I-G-H-T of the zebra, which sounded pretty strange, and I'm thinking about that, and then it spelled out, careful, he is listening. And they, <laughs> and they caught me, and I went, my God, i got to write that book. <laughs> and so I did. <laughs> you know, and I, the title suggested it had to be a comedy. This was 1967. The Bond films were just taking out, so it was a comedy uh, spoof of a uh, secret agent film with kind of an Inspector, Inspector Clouseau type of lead character. And it wasn't very good. And in any case, it got me thinking about th destiny. Oh, I keep pushing on one thing. So. All right. So 20 years later, I was going through one of the worst periods of my life. And I happened to come across this Roman proverb that destiny leads those who willingly follow and drags those who don't. And I essentially got dragged out of a job at my alma mater at the University of Pennsylvania and swept to NYU in New York City. And three or four years later, I realized it was at that point the best thing professionally that ever happened to me. So this was a case where I got kicked and I ended up in a better place. Uh, more recently, 
Okay. All right. <laughs> Can I just do it on here? Okay. This one. Okay. Well, now you see why I write. Um, in any case, very recently, I don't know if you're familiar with Martha Beck. She actually lives in Phoenix. She's a life coach. I've heard her present at a couple of conferences. I've read a couple of her books. And one of the things she says is the next time something really good happens to you, think of all the bad things that put you on that track. Okay? And that's happened twice in the last year and a half. I'm not quite done with destiny yet because I want to mention Jewel Parker Rhodes, who is the head of uh, the writing program at ASU, where I work, and a, an acclaimed novelist. I've known Jewel for 12 years. I think I've seen her four times during that 12-year period. I bumped into her one morning, and she had news about a writing program I happened to mention that I wrote. And she said, I want to read what you wrote. And I gave her Caliburn, and three months later we met, and she said, you know, you have potential, but you didn't do it. I will work with you for the next year to get it in shape, and she did. So I owe that. And also, Michelle, if you'll put your hand up, Michelle Peters, who uh, at the time worked at the Arizona Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies, she and I attended a um, one of these writing workshops. I told her about the story. She said, you have to bring the story to Bagwell. Oh, maybe I should, but I did. And you have to write a trilogy, which I had no intention of doing. I don't know if I let me add one last thing that was just uh, amazing. As I was walking in, a gentleman came up to me and he said, Are you Renzulli? I said, Yes. Virgil? He said, Yes. I fought with World War II during your dad. So Lou and his wife Kay, if you would just put your hands up. <laughs> I've never met them before. Um, I can't wait to call my mother tomorrow back and pull it off. Okay, so now by this point, you understand I'm kind of hung up on the idea of destiny. Uh, particularly with that Ouija board thing. What I wanted to know is, was this thing predicting my future and I was going to get there somehow? Or is anybody with average or sub-average intelligence, if you try something for 40 years, you eventually will succeed? But nobody really cares about what happens to a mid-level university um, administrator and a would-be novelist. And so I thought, I need to find some kind of dramatic spy to link this to to make it a more interesting story. And I thought of all the cases of destiny, in history, in fiction, or in legend, there is the sword and the stone. So I thought, what happens if Arthur would to pull that sword and say, you know what, I don't think I'm ready to do this. I'll just put this down. <laughs> would destiny drag him, ultimately? So that's the basic concept behind the story. But there's another thing that interests me, too, which is how uh, myth might be based on some kind of factual thing that happened in history, and conversely how reality sometimes gets blown into legend. So take, for example, the Trojan horse, which is one of the other great stories in Western civilization. And there are some scholars who say, yeah, there probably was, the Greeks probably really built that horse, and Ulysses and a bunch of Greeks were in it, and they got in. But there are others who say, you know what, it was probably a siege tower. And uh, Homer was just getting to be a little poetic in how he described this. So uh, those are the two aspects of the story, and I'll just sit for a minute so I can read it from here. But I'm going to just read you um, a couple of brief sections from the novel. Um, the first has to deal with um, the whole idea that, that uh, reality can be blown up into incredible legend. The story begins with two battle-hardened uh, British or Celtic warriors who are out hunting, and they, they run into a blizzard. If they don't find shelter, they'll probably freeze to death. And so, reluctantly, they, they take shelter in an abandoned castle that is supposed to be haunted by the specter of Merlin the Magician, who by then should have been long dead. And they go inside, and they happen to encounter an old man, uh, very old. He won't say his name, so they say, all right, we'll call you the old one. And he kind of hints that maybe he's really the Merlin, but he never admits it. And so he all makes this offer. My Merlin, by the way, is always hungry. He's kind of skinny, but he's always hungry. So he makes them an offer that uh, he will tell them a story if they will share uh, what they have hunted with him for dinner. And he says, I know many things and, and tell you all the great tales of our people. We've heard them all, says Alan. I know them at least as well as you. And the old one says, but do you? Have you heard stories or true stories? A tale is not like anything else. With a tail, a fish the size of a frog becomes as large as a horse with the telling and the retelling. 
A man who observes an archer score three successive bullseyes eventually becomes the archer. A tale about a flying cow is accepted without question by some because it's too improbable to be made up. He leaned closer to the two hunters. You see, there is fact and there is legend, and there's the place where fact and legend collide, and that's what they do in this story. So he offers um, to tell them a story that involves the traditional enemies of the British of that time, which would be the Norsemen, or Vikings, the Saxons, and the Pitts, who were from um, basically the area of Scotland. So Donald asked him, and do you know many Saxons, Pitts, and Norsemen? Well, I knew the ones in this story, or knew of them. Do you know the story of the sword and the stone? Alan Smirk, the story of Excalibur is the best known of all the Celtic stories. The old one, Excalibur is the sword of kings given to Arthur by the Lady of the Lake. The old one said in a tone of apparent satisfaction, it was Caliburn that was the sword and the stone, the sword of destiny. So in other words, you thought you knew the story, you didn't know the story, I'm going to tell it to you now. Okay, so what happens? As in almost all the Arthur stories, Arthur and his um, stepbrother, his older brother Kay, go to the annual tournament in Londinium. Uh, Kay is going to fight, Arthur is going to be his squire, and they misplace Kay's sword. So they go looking for it in the forest and they come across a sword in the stone. Arthur placed both hands on the handle of the sword and braced the leg against the stone. He took a deep breath and pulled. The sword came out so easily he almost fell over backwards. The sword felt alive, a sensation Arthur could only attribute to the vibrations that must have been caused by its being released from the stone's grip. This is Kay. Look at it, Arthur. See how it appears with light running up its blade. So now Kay says, as it does in all the stories, I want to try the sword. Give me the sword. Arthur hands it over. Kay kind of whips it around. He feels nothing. And then suddenly a crowd of people, other people who were in the, the tournament and other people who came to watch it, all show up. And arguments break out everywhere. And the two brothers don't know what they've done. And they hope, well, maybe Merlin will show up. And he'll tell us what's going on. His staff held high in his left hand. The wizard squeezed past people and pushed his way forward until he reached the front of the crowd. He looked first at Arthur, then at Kay. The wizard was motionless for a few moments. He grasped his staff with two hands. And Arthur thought it appeared as if Merlin had to lean on it to keep from losing his balance. Something had shaken the wizard because Kay still had a sword. Kay was king-elect and not Arthur. So destiny has been denied. And when that happens, there's got to be something that will drag you. And so Arthur, and I won't go into that part, I have to read the book, uh, ends up disgraced. The next morning, just before sunrise, Arthur's small band of men assembled to begin their journey. Arthur was in the lead. He was followed by three horse-drawn, two-wheeled carts, each horse with a rider, each cart loaded with supplies, mostly food, but also spare weapons and enough firewood to last a few days in case there was none at Hadrian's Wall. At the rear, rear there were nine foot soldiers. Except for the night watch, not a person observed them exit the main gate. How quickly circumstances change. Only days ago he had ridden before a cheering crowd at the Londinium tournament, holding his battle hammer aloft in a victory suit. Now he was going to the barren frontier. Arthur looked back at Valfane Castle as the first rays of the sun lit the corner of the tower. Most of the castle was still asleep. They were warm in their beds, sleeping in trouble, while he faced the cold morning and his own regret. So that gets him on the road that's not so good. And that's the drag from destiny. Um, characters in my story, obviously there's Arthur, but this is Arthur before he developed into a great uh, leader, king, that we all know. Merlin, of course, Merlin thinks he controls almost everything, controls almost nothing. He's constantly trying to do magic, but I'm never sure if he really does. Kay is uh, the older brother, and in my version, pretty incompetent. But he begins to believe his own press clippings, and at some point thinks he's actually as good as Arthur may be better. And Gurens, who is uh, one of the knights of all the stories in mind, he's the most influential. But uh, he's getting old, and he's uh, slipping mentally and physically. I've made up some characters. Brenna, young, beautiful, strong-headed, and indiscreet. <laughs> uh, Maeve, the worst combination you can have, somebody who is arrogant on the surface and insecure underneath. She is Brenna's um, stepmother and wife to yours. Bryso, who is the greatest knight at the time that Arthur arrives on the scene. Valo, who is a Saxon warlord, a megalomaniac, and a very successful warlord. 
Theo is a war weary Saxon warrior and Baal is a lieutenant. So those are the characters. So it, I think it is an unusual, it's not the typical Arthur story. So when I first thought about doing this, I thought, isn't it sacrilegious for me to take the story of King Arthur and change it? That was before I found out it's been changed a lot. Um, and, but it's a story that has lasted a very long time. Arthur was first mentioned in the 6th century. I think a more um, authoritative mention of him was in the 9th century uh, in the history of Britain. So I think Linnaeus was a monk. Uh, and he's mentioned there. Uh, and then we have Mallory's De Morte of Arthur, which really has set the stage. Most of the times you see Arthur, this is it. He's, he's in the Middle Ages. I believe this was written in the 14th century. And he was a knight in armor, and he jousted, and he, and he lived by the code of chivalry. In the 20th century, we had the Once and Future King. We had the Mists of Avalon. There have been all kinds of movies and television specials. This, by the way, Excalibur, the John Borman's film, you know. I don't think there's any visually more stunning Arthur story than this one. And you know what? There was even a Broadway musical. There was Richard Burton and uh, what is her name? <laughs> the movie with, uh, with Richard Harris was on a couple of weeks ago. I haven't turned it off. His, his, his Arthur was a little whiny for my <laughs> You can't have a whiny Arthur. So the question is like, why are we so fascinated with this story? Why have I been fat? I've known this story since I was six or seven. Well, first of all, knights are cool. Yeah. And if I knew he was going to be dressed that way, I would have asked to have a suit of armor and be up here because I think that's like a really cool stuff. I always wanted to own a suit of armor. In fact, I think one of the reasons that we find pro football so interesting today is they're modern knights, right? They have cool uniforms, they're wearing armor, and they knock their heads against one. So that's part of it. But Arthur, Arthur, of course, is a hero. He's kind of prototypical in that he's good and he's strong and he's brave and he does everything the right way and he's fair. I don't really think that's enough. I think what differentiates him is he actually built a built an utopia. And I can't think of any other hero that ever did. I think there were some uh, cult leaders uh, and some communist uh, nation leaders who said they'd build a utopia in this world and it turned out to be hell. Um, I think there were some religious leaders who talked about utopia later on in the next world, but I can't think of any, and maybe I'm wrong, who actually created a utopia where they, where they were. Another thing I think that's appealing about him is the circumstances from which Arthur arose. Um, he was conceived in treachery and deceit. He was raised in somewhat meager circumstances as kind of the Cinderella in his family. Uh, he also lived in a world of magic where futures are foretold and destinies fulfilled. There's the, um, there's the Ouija board again. And all those things are interesting. But also, he is tragic. He uh, loses his wife to his best friend, and he's killed by his son. So one of the things that occurred to me, and this is not Arthur, that is on the right and blue, is Hector outside the walls of Troy about to be killed by Achilles. And that, again, is one of the other great stories of Western civilization. Um, and uh, I always found <coughs> Hector to be the most heroic figure, not Achilles, not Ulysses. And I read someplace that there's probably no more heroic figure than the, the man or woman who is the last defense of a civilization, a culture, a country, a city-state that was going to be destroyed. And that was Hector. He was the last best hope of the Trojans. He, went, he knew almost certainly Achilles was going to kill him, and he went out and faced him anyway because it was his duty. So maybe the reason that uh, Arthur was so popular and Arthur in New York is because he was the last best hope of the British Celts yeah. to stave off the Anglo-Saxon invasions that eventually pushed the Celts to Ireland and Scotland and Wales. So maybe that's the reason that, he, that Arthur's kind of a, a figure like Hector. Uh, yeah. Okay, so what I find interesting about the story, I, I don't know, can anybody remember the first time you learned the story of King Arthur? It's like you were born with it. So even though there are all these wonderful things in there, there's a magic, he's going to become king, he's going to get the round table, he's going to have justice for everybody, you know it ends bad. Because you already know the story before you read it, you watch it, you hear it. And so there's this underlying thing of tragedy that hope doesn't happen, hope will happen. But on top of that, 
the story actually ends with hope. Uh, he's very not. Uh, Arthur, who's apparently got been mortally wounded by his son Morton, is actually carried off, ferried off on a boat to the magic island of uh, Avalon. And so, we're led to believe that he will resurface in the world. Even the Sword of Kings, Excalibur, when one of Arthur's knights throws it into the water, the Lady of the Lake's hand comes out, grabs it, and pulls it down. And so we think perhaps uh, maybe another hero of Arthur's stature will arise at some point, in which case I'll have the sword. Okay, so kind of in sum, we have triumph and tragedy, love and infidelity, utopia and betrayal, magic and hope. It's got everything, right? The Arthur story has everything. I don't think that's enough. And I don't know how familiar you are with uh, Joseph Campbell and the Power of Myth, but I think it was 1986 or 1987, PBS had a six-part series uh, with Bill Moyers. And um, Campbell studied myth, both uh, folklore and religious myth, and he said that there were ancient cultures that could not have possibly been in communication with one another. Ancient Hindu cultures and Indians in South America could not possibly have been in communication and they had the same myths. So how the heck did that happen? So he theorized, and I guess this is Carl Jung, that there's a collective subconscious that down deep we know these stories. And so these stories emerge in different cultures. They don't spread from one to another. They kind of rise up from the people. But they teach us something. And I'll tell you one story that was easy for me to understand because it always, always resonated to me. I don't know why. Every time I heard it, I got a little bit of a chill. This is the story of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. I'll tell it to you briefly. Uh, one night, Wayne's in a tavern or someplace, and in comes this humongous green knight, giant, who has a double-headed axe, and he says, I make a challenge to anyone here. Tonight, you can cut off my head. In a year and a day, I get to cut off your head. So they all knew, you know what? This is a trick. This guy's enchanted. You're not going to win. But like Hector, Wayne, because he's got to be brave, and he stands up and said, I'll do it. And so the giant bends over, Gwen gets the axe, cuts off the giant's head, the giant picks the head up by the hair and says, I will see you in a year and a day. So just about a year later, Gwen goes out uh, and he, looking for the green giant, the green giant, the green knights, uh, <laughs> well, that's where the green giant came from. And uh, he ends up finding out about the uh, little hut of a hunter and his wife. And the hunter says, well, you know, the, Green Knight's just down the road. You don't want to go on, you don't want to go to your execution any earlier. You have to stay here for a couple of days. We'll hunt, we'll talk, whatever. So they, he agrees to do that. And the first day, the uh, hunter goes out. Wayne is the second one going out. Well, the hunter has a beautiful young wife who tries to seduce Wayne. Wayne turns it down. Second day, she tries to seduce him. He turns it down. Third day, she tries to seduce him. He lets her get a kiss on the cheek. Fourth day, he goes to meet his destiny. There's the enormous green light. He said, okay, see that tree stump? Bend over, put your head there. Give me a good shot at your neck. He picks up that axe, he swings it, and he takes a little bit there, and he says, that's what the fish you stole. That's a story about crime. Mm -hmm. yeah, right? You get what you serve. Bread cast upon the water. So what on earth, then, and I think, you know, this is, again, I'm not an academic, I make things up, and this is what I made up a couple of weeks ago. What is it about the story of, of Arthur? Well, Buddha said that belief is the, desire is the cause of all suffering. Desire. There's something you want, you can't get it, so you're unhappy. There's something you want, you get it, and you lose it, and you're unhappy. You're going to lose at the end because you're going to die. So you're, like, if you keep desiring things, you're not going to be happy. Well, Arthur not only desired, but created a utopia. Right? One of the very few utopias anywhere. And what happens? He loses it. And we're rooting along with him. We not only want a utopia, we want a perfect hero. It's like, gosh, we've got Arthur. He does everything right. Ugh, he's gone. And I think, for those of you who remember the Kennedy administration, the Kennedys, that was going to be the new calendar. Things are going to be different with, that, with the family, this whole family with John F. Kennedy in 1960. And he was assassinated too. 
So maybe what appeals to us about this particular story is, you know, we have almost everything we want in our grasp, and then it kind of disappears. So, who was Arthur, if in fact there wasn't Arthur? Um, there was at least one author, uh, whose book I've read several times, who, and I don't know about her academic uh, credentials, but she's certainly not a fiction writer like me. She believes in the medieval knight king, Arthur, just as you would imagine, just as Mallory wrote it. That's absolutely true. Historical record, I've found things that show that's who he was. He wore plain armor, he jousted, he had cataloged, he knew Merlin, he knew Lancelot, he married one of them. That's all there. Uh, I hope one of you folks from the center can pronounce this guy's name. <laughs> it's not fun writing with Celtic names. In any case, there are others that say, well, maybe he was a 6th century warrior. And that makes, in fact, most, uh, I think, scholars believe that he was a 6th century warrior, which would have made him a Dark Age warrior. He would look more like this. He would have worn chainmail. He would not have worn plate armor. He would not have jousted. There would have been no coat of chivalry. There would have been none of that. Okay, so um, we do have that Nennius mention of him as a battle leader, or a king or battle leader, one or the other, who fought the Saxons. Um, one of the things that they sort of latch on to when they try to find the historical Arthur is that the name Arthur was not common. It seems like our Arthur was the first Arthur. So they look through history and try to find anybody with a similar name. One of them was Lucius Ortorius Castus, but he fought, he lived in the second century which was 400 years before the best guess is that Arthur actually lived. There's another Roman, um, his name was Arthur, and he lived in the 4th century, which is still 200 years to live. I think Arthur was probably a Celtic version of Arthur, a more Celtic version, a North Celtic version. There were a handful of, uh, of them who lived between the 5th and 7th century, and there were at least three men named Arthur, any one of which could have been Arthur. So maybe the name has nothing to do with it. I think this is pronounced Owen. But there are people, in fact, there's a whole documentary on the History Channel about how he fits the story better than anyone. He actually was uh, killed by his, uh, his nephew, who had a name somewhat similar to Mordred, and then the nephew took the throne. Uh, and what they say, and I think this is interesting, that Arthur wasn't really a given name. Art is ancient Celtic for bear. He was a nickname. Arthur the Bear. So it could have been Owen. And then there's Ryothamus. He was he could have been French. And the only connection there is that where he lived there was an animal. You know, so I think a lot of these things are tenuous, which is why I'm not sure any of them know what it is. Uh, so I would argue that it's better we don't know who it is. We don't we haven't got that. We have a lot of that's why the story can grow and morph and continue and be appropriate for different years. We know an awful lot about Constantine and Charlemagne. There aren't a whole lot of miniseries being made by them. As far as I know, there's yet to be a Broadway musical. <laughs> so I think we're better not knowing uh, who Arthur was. Uh, but here are some of the So this is why I did not commit sacrilege. Not till the 12th century were there, were there knights of the round table. There was no mention of them for 600 years. There was no Camelot. There was no Lancelot. Right? Those were added. In some, Guinevere's affair is with Marjorie. Not, not for um, And she's described variously as a pit princess and a Roman nobleman. Uh, Merlin has been decided, has identified with a wizard named Myrdin, and also a man named uh, Merlin Lovelkin, so I don't really know who Merlin was. That's changed. Excalibur has been given different uh, origins. Some said it was the sword from the stone. I say it wasn't. Uh, others say it was the sword uh, given to him by the Lady of the Lake. So you see, all that stuff is kind of up in the air. Um, this, I thought, was a very interesting book. There's a fellow by the name of uh, Adam Ardrey, and this book is relatively recent. And some of this sounds logical to me. He says, um, after the Dark Ages, the fall of the Roman Empire, when the Christian church was in ascendancy, the leaders of the church had a lot of problem with Arthur, because Arthur was a pagan. So here's this pagan, and he's probably the most popular legendary figure. And at the time, the church was commissioning monks to write lives of the states, saints, which were very dull. And Arthur kept being very popular. So they commissioned stories in which Arthur was actually the villain. 
I mean, he'd go into villages and he'd kick kids, you know, and things like that, spit on dogs. That did not go over. So they decided to diminish him. And they diminished him by making Lancelot a much better warrior. When you think about it, in those days, your physical ability as a warrior was one of the most important aspects of your leadership ability. They had his wife have an affair with his best friend, and they had him killed by his son. Tell me what else could go wrong with this son. It was like, why was this great? He had all these problems. Uh, finally, they made him Christian. So when you see Arthur uh, these days, he is primarily a Christian warrior of the medieval period, living by the code of chivalry. One of the best guesses is that he was probably a Dark Age warrior who didn't know anything about chivalry and did not have a white guard. Okay, so that's pretty much Caliburn. I'll tell you very quickly, and I'd like to recognize uh, Ken Lowell in the back, who did the cover illustration. The sequel is called Gods in the Mist. That is the cover. And unveiling it for the first time, the third part of this, which is I'm just finishing up, is called Hero, Legend, Myth. And that's the cover. So, <laughs> any questions or comments? <laughs> Don't ask me any tough questions because I. <laughs> will you be around for us to get the books? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. But I, I will say that the reason I have not become a famous author up till now is that my handwriting is so bad I'll be embarrassed to sign your books. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know exactly where I'll be. But, but. The name Caliburn is that one that you found in myth? Yes. Or did you create? Yeah, it? no, I didn't create it. And, and you see, it's kind of related to Excalibur anyway. Yeah, but no, that that part I didn't make up. Yep. Virgil, do your students know that you are an author and writing certain types of... Uh, no, I try not to tell them that because they'll think that my class is fictional too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you might become the most popular teacher. Today, <laughs> well, you know what, I, I worry that it's, it's kind of um, inappropriate for faculty to talk about their own textbooks. So I, I mean, when I was a reporter, I told stories about that. So I didn't want to say anything. <laughs> Yes, no. <laughs> uh, question from Segway. Uh, what do you teach that students may seek you out? Um, strategic communication at the uh, Cronkite School. And uh, part of what I get into is how um, communications, uh, how people perceive things and get things wrong, how they think things forward. If you saw the news today, this is an example of something I would use in my class. The Cleveland Cavaliers, you, you must probably all know. There's been such an issue, issue with domestic violence uh, among the professional athletes. And so the Cleveland Cavaliers, I think it was last night, they're playing Chicago, to be cute, to be funny, on the uh, screen uh, at halftime, had a husband and wife, and the wife turns around, and she happens to have a Chicago shirt on, and she runs to do a dance move, and he gets her and throws her in the crowd, and she gets injured. And so now they're, you know, like, now they're apologizing. So what, how would you think that was funny? So I think it, as you go through these things, the kind of the politicians, the things that politicians, so I don't know what it is, and I think especially with social media, it's getting people, a lot of stuff comes out completely unfilled. And another question, two more people that came in at the end. Do I have to do the whole thing over for you, Bergen? No, I <laughs> Okay, well I thank you. <laughs> <laughs>